have guessed today's particular area which is to do with ikhlas. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed significant emphasis on this topic of ikhlas. When we translate ikhlas into English, we usually use the word sincerity. We usually say that ikhlas is sincerity. The problem with any translation is that it's not always adequate and that ikhlas is much more than sincerity. So inshallah what we'll do today uh, in the minutes that are at my disposal is to try and define what is ikhlas, what constitutes ikhlas, what do we need to do in order to get to ikhlas and then look at why is ikhlas important, why is there a need for a person to have ikhlas in their life and then finally we'll look at the perfection and the best examples of ikhlas and see where that leads a person to. In doing so, hopefully we'll be able to get a better understanding of what ikhlas is and how we can apply that to our own lives. So first of all, what is ikhlas? Now this is something, one of the ways that the word ikhlas is used is very well known. It's a surah of the Holy Quran, we say, Surah Al-Ikhlas and that Surah of Ikhlas has nothing to do with sincerity and there's no mention of sincerity in that Surah Al-Ikhlas rather it's to do with the Tawheed of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala and also one of the names of it is Surah Al-Tawheed but the most common name for that Surah Surah number 112 of the Holy Quran which we all recite in our Salah is Surah Al-Ikhlas and so that means that, that this the topic of ikhlas is something deeper than just sincerity that we may associate it with. And of course in the root of ikhlas is this word khalam and sad which is used to define purity as well or absolute. When we say khalis, we say that something that is totally pure is khalis. There's nothing else added to it. And that is the meaning that is being referred to in this Surah Al-Ikhlas, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pure and that He's free of all those associations that people might associate with Him. That not only is He one, but He is the one of which there is no second. He is independent of all those who are dependent and that not only does he not have a father or a son but he's also there's nothing that is even can come close to being similar to him and that in his essence in his reality is unique and that is what the real meaning of ikhlas is is that a an action of a person becomes so pure and so free of any kind of attachment that there's no ulterior motive towards it. That there's no attachment towards it. When a person does any kind of action, there's always some kind of ulterior motive that's attached to it. Whenever I want to do something, before I do it, the first question I always ask myself is what is in it for me? What is in this action that will benefit me? What in this action will help me in whatever way, whether that is a worldly benefit, whether it's a benefit from the dunya, or it's a benefit from the akhirah. Either case, it is some kind of benefit that I'm looking for, from any kind of action. But Amir al what does he say? He says, 
I did not worship you, O oh Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Imam Hussain alayhi salam has a similar saying. I did not worship you, Khawfan min nar. I did not worship you because I was fearful of your hellfire. Wala taman le jannate. Nor did I worship you because I desired for your paradise. Bal wajatuka ahlan lil ibada fabatu. But rather, out of all the things being worshipped in this world, you're the only one who's worthy of being worshipped. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who's worthy of being worshipped, therefore I obeyed you, therefore I worshipped you. So that means that there, and Imam Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in a similar saying says that there's three kinds of worship. There's the worship of the merchants who worship because they they're doing business with God. They think if we worship, then we'll get paradise as a result of it. So, this is the worship of the merchants. And then there's the worship of the slaves who do worship because they're fearful of his punishment. And then, there are those who worship him because he's worthy of being worshipped. And this is the worship of the grateful. This is the real worship because they are grateful for the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted them with all the things that he has. <clears throat> so how does a person remove themselves from from this attachment of and make and get that person's action to become more sincere in their own life? So the first thing in, in analyzing the fact that a person needs to make the action pure is to look at the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has treated the person. If we examine the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala treats the person, I know that this topic is a little bit difficult to cope with in the beginning, but you have to bear with me so that we can get to the end of it. Recite another salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how has He treated the person? When we look at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all the stories that He's mentioned in the past, He's told us that from the beginning of time, whenever we sent a representative of ours, whenever we sent a prophet, there was always an enemy of that prophet. And that He reminds us that for, <coughs> from amongst the people, we've always made one who's an enemy of the Prophet because he's, at, he's an enmity is not towards personally towards that Prophet but his enmity is towards uh, the message that that Prophet is bringing but what was consistent in all of these things what was consistent in all these stories where there was a Prophet and there was an enemy of the Prophet whether it was the story of Musa salam and there was the Pharaoh in front of him or it was Ibrahim alayhi salam and Namrud was in front of him or it was another prophet and Shaddad was in front of him and so on and so forth. What was consistent amongst all these stories was the fact that at no point did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at no point did he ever stop the sustenance of the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At no point did the enemy ever complain that today I didn't get food to eat. At no point could the enemy say that today I was not given those necessities that I need in my life. No, all of the enemies, even though they rejected Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To think of Fir'aun who says, Ana rabbukum al -a'la. I'm your greatest Lord. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even for that person who not only rejects God, but claims himself to be God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is still providing sustenance for that person. So Allah is saying that, look, when it comes to how I've treated human beings, whether they believed in me or they didn't believe in me, I have given them all sustenance. I have made sure that they are still living their lives. I have not made, I have not at any point 
denied them those basic necessities that they need in their lives. Even though they rejected me, even though they claim themselves to be God. Now what is required from those who believe? So he says, for those who believe, I've given them extra and I've been generous upon them in terms of my special mercy. However, what is now required from those who believe is to see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala granted those who believe sustenance and He granted those who disbelieve, they also receive sustenance. Now from those who believe, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects that you commit those actions, you perform those actions solely for Him. You do not commit those actions, I do not perform an action thinking what is in it for me, but rather perform an action thinking that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects this action from me. And that I expect a reward from Him and therefore I have to make sure that my action is solely for Him. Imam Muhammad says that the person who seeks knowledge, the fruit of him seeking that knowledge is that his action becomes sincere. Once he increases his knowledge, his action becomes sincere. And the fruit of sincerity and the proof of sincerity or what sincerity leads to is certainty in a person's life. If a person re- re- desires for themselves to become certain about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certain about the deen, then they have to make sure that their action is sincere. How difficult this path is, is highlighted by the Holy Prophet of Islam where he says, the Holy Prophet of Islam says, that all of those who know will be destroyed except for those who act on what they know. All of those who know will be destroyed except for those who act on what they know. And all of those who act on what they know will also be destroyed except for those who are sincere, have ikhlas in their actions and wal mukhlisun ala al khatar and those who are sincere, those who have ikhlas, are constantly walking the tightrope. Those who are in ikhlas are constantly in difficulty, are in, constantly in trouble. Because maintaining this is the most difficult thing. When a person commits an action in private, the angels write down the reward of the ikhlas. Then when that person goes and tells somebody, I did this good deed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angels, now <coughs> remove this reward of ikhlas and just leave the reward of a good deed. Then when that person seeks to get a benefit from that good deed from themselves, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says now remove the reward of this action as well because this person received the reward of it from the dunya. So it's very easy for a person to pile up these good deeds. But it's just as easy for a person to remove the, all that reward that they were potentially going to get for that action because the action was not solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But what happens when a person does an action solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When a person does an action without worrying about the punishment and the reward. What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do for such a person? For that there's an example, which is a very beautiful example, which highlights this in the most magnificent way. Shaykh Abbas Qummi rahmatullah alayhi, who is the compiler of Mafatih al Jinnah was a great grand scholar in the house of Najaf al-Ashraf. And people recommended him, you should write books on such topics which will benefit the people in the house. 
And he said, no, I want to compile a book, I want to write a book which will benefit everybody, all of the people, and not just the people studying in the Hawza. So he thinks to himself, what should I compile as a book which will benefit everybody? And therefore he comes up with this manual of du'as and a'mal for the whole year. Of course we refer to Mufatihul Jinan generally in the holy month of Ramadan, but there's a'mal in the book are for the whole year. So he compiles this book, he comes up with all these a'mal and du'as from different works and different books from the Rawat of Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu salam for all the days in the calendar. And then he compiles the book and he completes the book. When he, once he completes the book and he's about to take it towards somebody to make copies of the book, of course we're talking about time where copies would have been made by hand. And he pauses to himself. He pauses and he thinks to himself that if I get this book copied and people get hold of this book and they come to me and they say, you wrote these actions in this book, you wrote these du'as and these a'mal in this book, and you're telling all of us to follow all these actions, these du'as, these a'mal in this book, did you perform them yourself? So what answer would I be able to give them? So he pauses, he comes back. And he begins to act on every single du'a and ziyar and a'mal in that book. So he spends another year acting on every single thing in the book. Once the whole year is complete and he's acted on every single du'a and Ziyar and Amal in the book, then he now decides now the book should be published. Now if somebody comes to me and says to me, did you act on every single thing, then I can say yes. All the things that I've prescribed in this book, I acted upon them first before I published it and invited you all to listen. So now he publishes the book, the book becomes well known, now it's a staple in everybody's house. But, how did it get to this stage? One day, Sheikh Abbas and his father come into the Haram of Amir al-Mu'min salatu salam and they shah salawat. And his father sees that there's a man with the Mafatih al-Jinan and he's reading some du'as from the book. So Shaykh Abbas' father says to him, I wish you were like this person who's doing these a'mal. Now if it was somebody like me, would have said, excuse me, I'm the one who wrote this book. This a'mal that this person is doing from this book, how did he? How did he know how to do the amal if I hadn't compiled this book and published it and distributed it everywhere? But he was not like me. He was one of the sincere ones. So he remained silent. Didn't say anything. He didn't say to his father, his father who didn't know that he compiled this book. He didn't say to his father, no, I'm the one who compiled this book, I'm the one who wrote this book. If it hadn't been for me writing this and compiling this and publishing it, then this person wouldn't have been doing these a'mal in the first place. He says, okay. And as a result of that, that he didn't tell anyone that this was his work that he had compiled this book. That today, there is not a Shia household in which this book is not found. Today, there is not a Masjid or a Husseiniyah where this book is not found and people all over the world are using this book, benefiting from this book and 
sending Fatiha and Salam to Sheikh Abbas Ummi today because of his work and the, the fact that he did it solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He didn't do it for any worldly gain, didn't do it for any fame or power or the fact that my name should be announced that I compiled this book. Today Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made sure his name is well known to every person. There might be many greater mushtahids from that same era that most people have not heard of. But everybody's heard of Shaykh Abbas Khummi because everybody's read Mafatihul Jannah at least once in their life, at least once a year, at least on Laylatul Qadr, at least on the day of Ashura. At least at some point in their life they referred to this book that was written by Shaykh Abbas Khummi and benefited from it and recited the Fatiha for his soul because they benefited from his work only and only because a person did something solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Nobody else. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Muhammad wa alaihi wasallam. So so far we mentioned that ikhlas is the purity of the action. Is the action that is so pure that it doesn't have any vested interest in it. And of course, in philosophy, we have this concept which is called altruism and there's a whole debate within philosophy as to whether it's possible for a person to truly be altruistic or not is it possible for a person to commit an action to do a deed without any vested interest whatsoever and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying this is what I expect from you, if you want that highest reward. Of course, if a person does an action with the intent of getting reward, then that person will receive the reward. But the greatest action and the perfection of the action is for a person to remove themselves from this philosophy of reward and punishment and go greater than that. For what reason? If a person commits an action with the intent of reward and punishment, then they, their action is then determined by, by the fact in the dunya, this is in the akhirah, in the dunya by the fact of whether they will get some kind of benefit or not, or they will be prevented from some kind of harm or not. And therefore the quality of my action is now dependent upon something else, somebody else. If a person therefore doesn't act well with me, if a person doesn't act good with me, then I'll think, why should I act well with that person? If somebody is not giving me any benefit, then I'll say, why should I have any kind of relationship with this person because they're not giving me any benefit, they're not adding any value in my life. But, the, per, the, the perfection of action is to be free of that, is to move even greater than that. And of course, there's many philosophies like this. There's one philosophy which actually or, originates from Canada. It's called the real human being philosophy. And in that, there's, there's three gears. There's the first gear, and the second gear, and the third gear. And the third gear is this philosophy that a person does an action without this incentive of reward or fear of punishment. That they're doing the right thing because it's the right thing. For a person to do the right thing because it's the right thing and for no other reason other than that. And therefore, my action is now free from depending on other people and depending on what the other person will do for me. In fact, there's many sayings like this, character, is when you can do something for somebody who can't do anything for you. Because in, in any other case, I'm expecting something else in return from a person when I'm doing an action. And the greatest example of Tao, the greatest sign of Tao, the greatest level of that is with Ahlul Bayt alayhi salatu wassalam. who say 
after doing a deed in which there is no possibility that this person could re return anything to them. On top of that, they say, famous verses of Surah Al-Insan, which you're all familiar with, وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا إِنَّمَا نُطْعِمُكُمْ لِوَجْهِ اللَّهِ لَا نُرِيدُ مِنْكُمْ جَزَاءً وَلَا شُكُورًا They say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about them that they feed the orphan and the captive and the wayfarer out of his love. And then they say to them, those people for whom, who could do nothing for Ahlul Bayt al they could not return anything in any way. To them they say, We fed you, not for any other ulterior motive, except that we did it for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La nuridu minkum jaza'an. And we do not desire from you any reward for this. And not even do we want thanks for it. Usually when we're doing actions in which nobody can do anything for us, we say at least the person could have said thank you. At least the person could have expressed gratitude for the fact that I did this action. But Ahlul is saying that if you want to get to this perfection of action, then you have to remove all your expectations and say there's no expectation whatsoever. And that's the greatest kind of action. And what does that lead to? It leads to these verses which I read right at the beginning of the lecture, which is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala creates Adam and then Iblis refuses to do the sajda. It's mentioned more than one occasion in the Holy Quran. This occasion when it's mentioned, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relates the fact that shaitan says, فَبِعِسَّتِكَ You imagine. This is Iblis who's just refused to do sajda, but he's saying, فَبِعِسَّتِكَ I swear by your honor, Iblis has refused to do sajda, but he's not a disbeliever. He's such a believer that he swears by the honor of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It says, Fabi is zatika. I will, I swear by your honor that I will misguide people. All of them, Ajma'een. I will misguide all of them. I will take my revenge out of Adam on all of the people, everyone who descends from Adam. Illa ibadak al The only people that I can't misguide are whom? Are those whom you have made mukhlas. Those whom whom you have taken to that stage that when they do a good deed, they don't even desire for thanks. When they do something good to a person, they don't even desire the person to say thanks to them. They don't even desire any gratitude from that person. Those people I cannot misguide. And it was imperative for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have people like that whom Iblis could not misguide to show that yes, Iblis is very powerful but even his power is limited. There are those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen. There are those whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided in such a way that Iblis is unable to reach that. He's unable to He's unable to misguide them. He's unable to reach there. N not to the fact that he doesn't try. It's mentioned in a riyad that he comes to every single prophet. He comes to all the Imam 
There's dialogues with Iblis. But he's not successful. They have reached that level of connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because there is no incentive of reward or punishment. And how does Iblis misguide, misguide through this incentives, through these incentives? But what is, what is the significance of what does this result in? If a person realizes that their action is solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what does that lead a person to understand? And this is the final thing and then inshallah we'll conclude. When a person realizes their own value, when a human being realizes their own value, then for that person to be sincere, for that person to do an action solely for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that path becomes so much more understandable. A person realizes that why is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expects this from them. Out of everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created, out of all of the creation. There's no other creation after having created it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes pride in. Other than the human being. After giving us this detailed description of how the human being is created in Surah Al-Mu'minun, he says, فَتَبَارَكَ اللَّهُ أَحْسَنُ الْخَالِقِينَ Blessed is he who is the best of creators after having created the human being. So, out of all of creation, human being is the best out of all of his creation. Everything else is also a creation. Out of his creations, all of these things are also the creation. The sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, everything within the dunya are all his creations. In addition to that, Paradise and hell are also his creations. Now if human being is superior to all his creations, then does it make sense for something which is superior to desire for that which is inferior to him? When the human being is superior to all creation, then does it make sense for the human being which is superior to desire for something which is inferior to himself, which is paradise and hell, which are inferior to him. No. Then what does it mean? What does this mean that if paradise is inferior to human being, human being is superior, then what should that person, what should that human being desire for? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, if you desire for me, if you desire for me, then I will make you worthy. I will make you worthy to enter into that place which is closest to me. I will make you worthy that no, you shouldn't have that desire. But rather, Holy Prophet of Islam says that there are four people for whom paradise desires that they should come into me. Holy Prophet Islam says there are four people in this world for whom paradise desires that they should come into me. So Ya Rasulullah, who are they? He says Ali wa Salman wa Abu Dhar wa Mikhtar. Paradise desires that they come into me. If they come into me then paradise would become paradise. Because they have Realize their own worth. When on the day of Khandaq, Holy Prophet of Islam says to his companions, he says, those of you who go out and bring me the news of the victory of my brother, I will guarantee you paradise. Everybody goes out, except for Salman. The Holy Prophet says, Salman, don't you want to go to paradise? He says, yes I do. He says, then how come you didn't go out? He says, Ya Rasulullah, I considered for a moment, then I thought to myself, that when I'm sitting next to the one who has control over paradise, 
when I'm sitting next to the one who has control over paradise, then how should I? Why should I leave his company to go somewhere else? Later on when they came in, he says, Ya Rasulullah, congratulations on the victory of your brother. This first person comes running in, is fuming. He says, Salman, you were sitting here all this time. Maybe Salman might say, he doesn't say this, I'm saying, maybe he might say to that person, that you did all this effort to try and get paradise, but you didn't get it. And here I am, I sat next to the Holy Prophet of Islam. And I got it because paradise is not about running after things. Paradise is about realizing your own worth. And the first step to realizing your own worth is making sure that I do everything only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's making sure that whatever I do is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that way I realize my own value and my own worth. And that there's no example, no greater example of a person realizing their own worth. Then Imam Hussain wasalam, realized when he left Medina. It was the end of the month of Rajab. Where it's mentioned that Imam Hussain wasalam, was sitting with Abdullah ibn Zubair in the Masjid of the Holy Prophet. Wasalam. In Masjid Nabi in Medina, when a when the messenger of the governor comes to Imam and he says that Ya Ibn Rasulullah, the, the governor wants to see you. Abdullah ibn Zubair is curious. He says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, do you know for what reason you've been invited by the governor? No, no, nobody knows this yet. Imam Hussain says to Abdullah ibn Zubayr, he says, the ruler of Syria, the ruler of Sham, son of Ab Abu Sufyan has died. Nobody knows yet. Imam Hussain is telling Abdullah ibn Zubayr. He says he's died. And Yazid has succeeded him as the Khalifa. And the question is of pledging allegiance. So Abdullah ibn Zubair says, Ya ibn Rasulullah, so what are you going to do? The Imam says to him, wait and see. The Imam says to Abdullah ibn Zubair, you wait and see what I do. He leaves the masjid and he goes to, he goes home. And then accompanied by the young people of Bani Hashim, he comes to, comes to the palace of the governor. He says to the youth of Bani Hashim, I want you to wait outside. I will go inside and discuss with the governor, whatever the matter is. If at any point my voice is raised, then you come inside. Imam Hussain al -Salam goes inside. One narrative states that Walid reads out the letter to him. Another narrative says that he begins reading the letter, but he's embarrassed to read the whole letter. And he hands the letter over to the Imam, for the Imam to read it himself. In either case, when the Imam reads the letter, or he's, hears the contents of the letter, he says to Walid, wouldn't it be better if this announcement was made in the daytime in the Masjid of the Holy Prophet while all the people were there? You've called me at night. And Walid says that this is a reasonable request. We will convene tomorrow morning and this announcement will be made in the public. Marwan, who's present there, intervenes 
and he says, if you let Hussein go now, then you will not get him again. You will not be able to capture him again. Imam Hussain raises his voice and he says, O son of the prostitute, do you threaten me with death? Are you threatening me? When his voice is raised, the youths of Bani Hashim come in. Imam alayhi salam takes them back out and he proceeds back home. But he says something that every time I consider this statement of the Imam, I wonder how did the Imam say this? He says to Abu al-Fadl al-Abbas, he says, Abbas, this city of Medina, this city of my grandfather Rasulullah is no longer a city worth living anymore. It's no longer a place that is worth living in anymore. In another narrative, Marwan meets the Imam outside and he says, I advise you to pledge allegiance to Yazid. This will be better for you in the dunya and the akhirah. Imam Salamullah alayhi replies, he says, my salam to an Islam of which Yazid is the Khalifa. Mithli, la yubay o mithli. A man like me will not pledge allegiance to a man like Yazid. He ends the discussion entirely by saying a man like will not pledge allegiance to a man like Yazid. This wasn't a battle of one man against another man. This was a statement, a policy from the Imam. This was a statement, a policy from the Imam that in every time there will be people like Yazid. And if you have the courage like Hussein, then you've got to stand against in every time. In every time there will be people like you. And if I'm reliving this message of Muhammad by commemorating the Muharram every single year, then it means that I'll have to stand against those Yazids in my time. Muhammad comes into the house and he orders preparation for the journey.